long. So you'll start to see my desktop in just a moment. And I'm going to swap over to the tab that I have open here in my browser. And the local screen on that. Okay, so so this this is a document that you can look at yourself. And I put I've pasted the link to it in the email and various times and make reference to it. So at the top of the document I've got links to a few things that you might want to check out. So for example, if you're the type of person who likes to share things on Twitter and discuss them in less than 140 characters and you want to get lots of ideas, then follow me and I'll might most likely follow you back. Um, I have a podcast that's available as well, so I've not been recording very many episodes of that, but over about a two-year period, I recorded one episode a week, and it was all about how I was teaching my GCSE computing group. At the moment, I have, I think I'm on my, let's see, when, I think I've got my fourth class, yes, fourth or fifth class at the moment doing GCSE computing, and sometimes I share some of my ideas and my ramblings in a blog here. And the reason why tonight's podcast is available for free is because I've received some funding from the DFE, the Raspberry Pi Foundation, and RM Computer uh, Education Limited, to make a whole program of activities available for teachers over an 18-month period. So from next month to April 2016, I'm going to be taking events that I've been involved with, like Hack to the Future, Raspberry Jam, and these Hack Jams. We're going to be touring the north of England and the Midlands. And if there's any way you can come along, or if we can, if you're in the, in those areas and you want us to come and visit you on our roadshow, then let me know, and then we'll see if you're eligible. As part of that, there's 28 of these online seminars for teachers. Now, I have an idea in my head about the kind of things that you might like to have in a seminar that's going to help you online, but it's possible that I that my judgment might not be accurate. So one thing you can do is in the chat tonight, you can type things in, and I can perhaps change what I'd planned or answer your questions or it may be that I feature one of your queries in a future episode. This podcast, uh, sorry, this podcast, web webinar, whatever you want to call it, is being recorded and later on you, you'll you have access to go back and look at this and I'll share some of the notes from that. I still also do some in-school CPD training. So in our school on the 24th of November and the 10th of November, you could, if you choose, come and spend a day here where I'll show you some of the more practical elements that I can't do in a, in a just webinar. Like you could come and watch me teach my GCSE computing class. Um, I've got examples of coursework that I can share, live examples as well that you know would help some people in some way. Now, I'm going to scroll down a little bit to, this is number two, Wednesday, 22nd of October. And I have a, 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 a rough plan for this evening, which is, in the next half hour or so, I want to share some of the things I've been thinking about and working on this week. Then I'm going to spend about 15 minutes giving more of an insight into things specific to GCSE computing. And then the last 15 minutes or so, a question and answer. Now, I've not actually had many suggestions yet for the Q&A. So if something occurs to you, you could type Q and A into the chat and then I'll Keep an eye out for that. I've got a couple of computers all going at the moment, so I can watch things on different screens. Now, what I'm going to do in just a moment is I'm going to start talking about some of the things that I've been doing with my classes this week and some of the things I've been trying out with them. I'm actually going to start with this one here, first of all, this 7 to 9 quiz, and I'll explain a little bit about what that is. So, um, I feel like I'm, I'm still on a, on a journey of development of over introducing computing into our school. If I was to look back, I think we started in 2008, 2009, we started introducing things like Scratch. Around about 2011 was where we introduced text-based programming with Python. And we had, we've had Arduinos and uh, web development and, and lots of things like that that we've been doing that weren't necessarily in the previous ICT curriculum. And one of the things that we've always struggled with, really, is how we assess children's progress. And now that the levels have been disbanded, the, the assessment levels of attainment levels, um, 
and and we don't have any for computing it's well, well well how do we actually measure progress how do we how do we standardize that and that and that's something that causes some challenges and some difficulties and one of the other things was which i've mentioned before a little bit we're you know we're an electronic uh sort of based subject area and you would kind of imagine really that if we're getting children to respond to things we should be doing so in, in an electronic way using computers where possible not just for the sake of it, but to try and find ways that we can use computers to save time. Now, we, we did for a couple of years, we used our school Moodle to, to send assessments to children and, and then they would respond to those and they would hand in samples of their work and we would assess them online. And then one of the issues we found was we have these book scrutinies in school where members of the senior leadership team will collect samples of books from different curriculum areas. So they collect books like from maths and English and technology and ICT, computing as it's now called. And they always had a difficulty assessing, uh, measuring how effective we were assessing children's progress because one, our work was online. So you couldn't just collect the books in and it wasn't very easy for us to share that. We'd have to print things out. And, and then the other thing was Sometimes we have these like lesson drop-ins where somebody will, will call into one of our lessons and may say to a child, oh, um, hello, Ellen. Um, so, you know, how, how well are you doing in computing at the moment? You know, what, what kind of feedback have you had from your teacher? And because they only had one or one lesson a week or three hours in a fortnight, children, and they weren't as used to doing it as they were with exercise books, the children couldn't just automatically say, oh, you know what, I'll just log into Moodle, click, click, click here, and I'll show you that this is how I'm doing. And we were using techniques and strategies and mechanisms that weren't being used widely in the rest of school. And we always kind of stumbled on that a little bit. So in the summer term, I just was discussing with one of my colleagues the, uh, the notion of having some quizzes that would be marked online electronically and we, we are still using exercise books, but we find that in the main, the things that we're assessing in the exercise books are mainly with a focus on literacy. So um, I'm just going to find something as an example to show you. So um, this, is, this is my timetable at the moment. You might notice it's quite light on a Friday, and so I can do all these jam-packed activities. Now, I've, I'm going to select here my class I teach in year nine. This is the extension set we call them so it's a top set in year nine and if I zoom in a little bit more I can I'll send you links to all of these later on you can have a look at um, I set them some questions a couple of lessons ago where they had to answer some questions and respond to them now <laughs> I've just remembered and I've just realized that those questions were questions that I read out in class so it was here e-safety assessment and there were questions like um, your your sister or your cousin, 11 year old, they've just got a laptop for Christmas or for their birthday and they say to you, oh this is great, they can go off in their bedroom and they can do whatever they want on their laptop and they think it's fantastic. You're 14 years old. What kind of advice would you give them? Because if they're not very careful, some nasty things might happen. So, so I read out some questions to them in class and they had to answer those in their books. And then I would collect those books in, and then I'd look through them for grammatical spelling errors. Um, if there was any kind of errors in judgment, you know, if they were said, oh, uh, I'll tell my cousin, this is great, she's got her own laptop, she, she can spend hours on Facebook, she can download like loads of illegal movies and games and all that kind of thing. So if somebody had written something like that, then I'd correct it and say, no, um, I really don't think that's the kind of advice you need to be giving to your 11-year-old cousin. So... So these are the kind of things that they're doing in their exercise books. And I'm going to show you an example of another one. So this is this is one I used with a year 11 um, class last week. So what I did was I actually got them, I got some exam questions, rephrased them and reworded them slightly, but not, not much different. And these are the kind of questions that I gave them. Now, do you know what I'm going to do? Because this is, probably seems very, very one channel at the moment. I'm going to pause and ask you to look at A, B, C, D, and E. And if you could just in the chat type in, you could do a T for shorthand for true, an F for false. So if you think they're all five of them are true, could you just now in the chat type in T, 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 five times for true, 
or if you think some of them are false, then indicates. And we'll have a look at the, the answers that you respond with. It doesn't matter if you get them wrong. If you get them wrong, we can discuss them. While you're thinking about that and you're responding, the point I'm making at the moment is about how we're using exercise books. And, and by using exercise books, we now find we're, we're in parallel with, with all the other processes that are happening in school and procedures. And the children um, are very used to the practice of using exercise books. So there are certain approaches and policies that because everybody within the different curriculum areas in school are doing the same thing, it's actually you know, in harmony. I actually find it's easier to use exercise books than I originally thought they might be. I'm still waiting to see your answers. Oh, do you know what I've done? I've scrolled the wrong way. So, Okay, so we've got a few different answers. We've got, oh, it looks like we've got agreement. It looks like everybody's agreed that the first three are true and the last two are false. So let's have a look. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to agree with you on, on, on all of those. So, so that was the kind of thing I got them to write in their exercise books. Paul's really done it like in a nice way, set it out, if you can tell if it's A, B, C, D, or E. And, um, and if I show you another one, another question, the, the, the question four was a lot more, or question two actually, um, sorry, I mean question three. Question three is a lot more open-ended. It, it, it says there's a, a game console and a desktop can be there two different types of computer system. How is a game so, console different and how is it similar to a desktop computer? With reference to input, output, and storage. So this this was my year eleven class. Very similar thing to when I described in my year nine. So they all answered the questions in the books. I collect the books in and I mark them. And let me show you what I've done next with those. So I, I've taken their scores for those and I've typed them into a spreadsheet. Let me find the spreadsheet, which is online, and it looks like this. So it's actually this column over here, which I've just highlighted, so I can, oh, oh, I didn't mean to do that. So what I've done is I've just, it's actually not too bad. I'm now revealing the scores that each of the children got for those different sections of that piece of work. So Ryan was absent, so he got zero for that. Whereas um, Lewis, he got a five, a three, a four, a five, which total are 17. It was out of 24. I've used a formula to turn that into a percentage. Now I need to hide those again, really, because I didn't mean for them to show. I hide those columns. Now, there's a number here in this column, and I'll choose Casper as an example. Now, Casper didn't score four for that question. What he actually scored was he actually scored four above his target grade. Now. As I imagine you will have in your school, you will have target grades set for your different pupils. Now, I'm not going to tell you what Casper's target grade is, but what I can tell you is it'll be one of these over here. And if Casper's target grade was an A star, what I've worked out is in the exam, Casper needs to score 76 or more to achieve an A star in the exam. If, however, his target grade is a 26, sorry, is an E, he would need to score a minimum of 26 to achieve his target grade. Now, without me telling you what score Casper got on those questions or, or what his target grade is, you can see at the moment that because he scored four, what I've actually done is I've subtracted um, his target grade away from the, the score that he got in that piece of work in his exercise book. And he's, he's, he's four in credit. So that actually means that if he was, his target grade's an E, he scored 30. So, so he's doing okay. Or if his target grade's an A star, he's, he scored 80, which also means he's doing okay. Not doing as okay as he did last time, because we did two quizzes which were multiple choice ones using Moodle. And in, and, and in the two of those, you can see he actually scored a lot more above his target grade than that. He got 13 and 16. And I've got those colored bright green so that you can see um, that was quite an exceptional performance. Now, um, trying to follow a thread of thought through. <laughs> That's a lot of THs for an Irishman to fit in. Today I had the class and, I, said, and I, I, I asked them, you know, if I was to ask you this question, if I was to say to you, 
the, the square, sorry, the, the, the actual area of, of land in the whole of Lancashire, which is where our school is, is it A, B, C, D, or E? And you would have different answers for them. You wouldn't know exactly the answer to that question, but you'd, you'd have at least a one in five chance of, of getting it right if you guessed. You, it, 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 when you look at them, you might think that some are ridiculous, so you'd be able to narrow it down and hopefully get the right answer. However, if I just said to you, what is the area of Lancashire, and I didn't give you any answers, I don't think you'd score as highly on that. So these two quizzes that they've done in class, which I'm highlighting now, these were actually multiple choice quizzes, which are hosted on our Moodle. And they are exam questions as well, but, I, but most of them have five or more answers So for them to select from. Whereas the one that we did in the exercise books, I wasn't giving them the answers. So some, so some people have actually, there, there isn't a massive difference between their performance on the two. Like, for example, Joseph, you can see in the quizzes in Moodle, he's scoring a 4 and a 10 above his target grade. And when he did it in his exercise book, he scored a 4 above. So, so that's pretty good. And then there was some that it was actually disastrous. So if you look at Aaron, Aaron's doing really well on the multiple choice quizzes. So Aaron's clearly very good at guessing answers to, to questions. But the one he did in his book wasn't as good. So what I'm hoping is if I have a variety of ones that they've done, the, the multiple choice, I mean the multiple choice ones, I don't have to mark them. It, it's There's a huge investment of time for me to set these quizzes up so that, you know, to make sure that the, the questions are challenging enough. Whereas the, the questions in the book, it, it took me an hour or so to go through and mark all of those. And and maybe my marking might not be as accurate or as standardized necessarily as, as the others are. So, okay. Now, the reason I mentioned all of this, if I go back to our agenda, was uh, which is appearing on now, I'm, I wanted to talk about seven, year seven, year eight, and year nine. So we have set up similar quizzes now for, for year seven, year eight, and year nine. They're asking them questions about the kind of things that they're learning about at the moment in year seven, year eight, and year nine. What are they learning about at the moment? Well, let's have a look. If I go back to this document, which has got my timetable, I have here a, this is our plan for Key Stage 3. You might look at it and think, ooh, that, that, that seems quite light. Uh, let's increase the viewing size. You can have a look. So, it, each number over here on the left hand side corresponds to a week number. So year seven, they have one lesson a week. And year eight and year nine, they have three and a fortnight. Now, I'm still watching the chat window over here. So if there's any questions or things you want to ask me at the moment, then you're not interrupting me. It's fine. This is kind of how this works. I want to try and keep it interactive, but without having lots of microphones all going at the same time. So question one. Sorry, oh, wait a minute. Topic one, week one, we actually focused on e-safety. And these were the things we expected the children should be able to explain and identify, no matter whether they're in year seven, year eight, or year nine. And there's some homework related to that. And as I scroll down the weeks, you'll see week two, week three. This is with key stage three. We're focusing on things like the components of a computer, the internal components, the peripherals, and we're just coming to the end of our about our tenth week with sevens, eights, and nines. So things like operating systems, application software, system software. Most of our classes are round about this point at the moment, and I've got some resources in there that links to various things online that we're using. So reading back through those, so we've got things like operating systems, software, peripherals, so an introduction to the labels that we use for these things and and all of that. Now, I'm just reading the questions come in from Anthony. Um, so that's something that I'm going to come back to later on, Anthony, at, at the end of it. Now, Michael asks if I can make this scheme of work available to download. So, there's a link. This document here has my timetable. And if I give you my timetable, you can click on any of my classes and you can read the class notes that I'm sharing with my classes. And just below that, there is a link to this. So I'm going to actually just copy that and put that in the document that we're using tonight. So I'll just stick that in here for now till I tidy it up later on. And now you know you've got a link to that. 
And if you want to have a look at what my timetable is at any point, and ask me how is it that I don't have so many classes on a Friday, you just type this into so tinyurl.com slash techno links. And as well as my timetable, if you scroll down, you'll see there's a huge wealth of things in there that I've been collecting resources and all that kind of thing. It, it's when I see something that looks really good, I grab it and I stick it in that document. But anyway, that's that's not what I'm planning to go to at the moment. So you'll find that in there. Okay, so what I was doing was I was showing you my key stage three timetable. Yeah, uh, sorry, scheme of work. Now, we actually took the decision last year that we were going to start preparing our children for the GCSE right in year seven, eight, and nine. And part of our reasoning and rationale for that was because I've, I've had children in year 10, at the beginning of year 10, in the middle of year 10, GCSE computing, and even in year 11 saying, uh, I don't want to do this. What, what, why are we doing so much stuff about binary and hexadecimal? And we seem to be doing an awful lot of coding. And the kind of questions and issues that they were raising seemed symptomatic of the fact that they didn't really understand what they had in store when, when they chose to do GCSE computing. So what we're trying to do more and more is give them a lot more experience of, of what's involved in the GCSE. So looking at e-safety is kind of relevant, but it's more about these kind of things like inputs, outputs, storage devices, um, CPU, RAM and ROM. So I, I dropped into a colleague's lesson today and I could hear a year, a year eight class where they were discussing the, the, the difference between RAM and ROM and how was one different from the other. And, 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 and it doesn't matter so much that it, you know, we're what are we eight weeks or so in with year eight, and they were discussing things from week four because this colleague had said to me, "Well, um, actually, I've decided I want to do the internal things after the external things." So we've got that flexibility built in. But we do know that by the, the half-term holiday, really, we should be finishing hardware and software, and about ready to start things like binary numbers, logic gates, and sequencing of instructions. Now, actually, this is weeks. So I'm, I'm, I'm racing way ahead of myself because really we're just on the point of system software, utility software, and then we're going to start looking at logic and, and, and all those things. So that's where am I back up to? Back to my agenda. So that, that's where I'm up to with the quizzes at the moment. Now, the thing I haven't explained is we have some quiz questions that I've written on Moodle that are asking children about those kind of questions. So like one of the questions, for example, has three empty blocks that are linked together in a diagram. And it asks the children, which of these is the input, which is the process, and which is the output? Now, one of the nice features in Moodle is you can get it to randomize the answers. So clearly, if it said which box is the input, which is the process, and which is the output, you'd probably think, oh, well, the left, the middle, and the right-hand side one. And in fact, some of the children, when they answered the question, that, that was the order in which they answered them. But they hadn't read the question. But the question said, which of these is the process? Which of these is the output? Which is the input? And where some of them got it wrong, it was because they literally hadn't read the question. So the early indications has been from the quiz. We've actually set the same quiz at the moment for year seven, year eight, and year nine. And we are starting to see things like classes in year nine are scoring you know, 70, 80, 90 percent with the odd child scoring 20 or 30. And in year seven, we're seeing scores of sort of 20 or 30 percent because it's still very early on for them. They haven't done a, a, a great deal of time on those topics. But what we now have is we now have a standardized assessment system that's still, I'd say, raw and it's in its early stages. But I'm hoping that the model that we've got, we can develop and then I'm looking for a way we can incorporate that into the exercise books. So when the children look at the exercise books, they've got their written responses to questions which we've dealt with in class. But the, I want them to find a way of recording their scores from these quizzes, which come back as a percentage. And the other thing which I didn't mention was when they do the quizzes on Moodle, it, it, at the end of the quiz, it tells them what their score was. And it shows them the correct answers for the questions that they got wrong. So I've been asking the children to go back and try to summarize which were the particular types of topics where they felt that they were going wrong on, and then to, to write that in their exercise book to say, um, oh yeah, the, the base computer system model, I still haven't really got that in my head. That's something I need to come back. So I'm trying to make it smarter so that the children can realize where they're going wrong and what it is that they need to, 
you know, to, to, to brush up on. So what I've done in, in, in discussing that, I've, I've kind of touched on this one here as well, the, the exam questions with year 11. But I'm going to come, I'm going to discuss a little bit about my homework club. And then, you know what I can do? This bit here actually fits in to this section here about GCSE computing. Now, although I've, I'm talking specifically sometimes about GCSE computing, I'm finding more and more the things that I'm using, the procedures and processes and strategies I'm using are actually filtering down into year seven, year eight, and year nine. Now, Nicola asked, do all key stage three years follow the same curriculum? Or is that for transition to the computer science scheme of work? So I'll, I'll answer that in as much as I think you're asking, which is this scheme of work that I showed you, those topics, those topics are exactly the same for year seven, year eight, and year nine. So our destination, I would expect that sevens, eights, and nines will all arrive at this area here by the end of the autumn term. What I clearly wouldn't expect in terms of logic gates, I would really only be expecting from year sevens that, and again, okay, there's a whole cross section of, of, of year seven, but I would expect that they can at least identify the fact that they are logic gates and be able to maybe name that, that oh, that's an AND gate and that's an OR gate. Whereas I would hope with year nine that I could show them a truth table for logic gate for the AND, OR, and NOT with some gaps and they could identify. But we've already started this with year nine as well this year. So if you imagine our year sevens next year coming back to visit logic gates just before Christmas and then again in year nine, there's how we're hoping to build in the progression so that we will still visit those same topics just as in maths they, you know they do fractions in year seven they do it in year eight they do it in year nine and they do it as part of their gcse and, and that's the same kind of model i'm hoping to that, that that that's the model i'm following whereas we used to have a different model where we would you know we'll do text-based programming in year eight we'll do web development in year nine and we just had too many different things going on all over the place and I would find at the end of the year eight or year nine, we do these pupil voice surveys. What did you learn in the year? And they could only ever really recount the things that they'd done most recently. So this is still a work in progress. And and, and I will in future seminars, webinars, come back and, and share some more of the detail as well about what, what we're actually doing in that. Now, um, I'm just looking back at our program. We're coming up to, to 6.30. So, I've, I've explained a little bit about those exam questions, and they, if you want to find those, um, I'm just going to put another link in here to them. So you'll, you'll notice I use these tiny URLs quite a lot because I've got into a habit of finding it. It's a very quick and easy way of sharing a URL with a class. And what's even better is if you have a document like this, a Google document, you can, you can see as I'm changing this document now, if you've got a version of it open in your browser, you'll also be able to see that I'm making those changes straight away. So if you click on that link, that will open in your browser the, the notes that I share with my year 11 class. And it's worth zooming in to 150, so we can see. And you'll be able to see everything I'm doing. So, so for example, today, I'm actually written today's date in. <laughs> a bit lazy there. Today, I gave them back their exercise books in which I'd marked the answers, I'd, and I just wrote a score next to each one. And one thing that we're always being asked to do in our school is to demonstrate the impact of assessment. So I've assessed their exercise books, handed their exercise books back with the score that they received. So it might say 12 or 24. It's a, it's a raw score, not the percentage. And I've written, you know, I've, I've, I've identified a few spelling mistakes. So some people talked about Braille, and they not spelt it correctly. Uh, somebody had the word similar spelt wrong, so I've circled that, and um, the, 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 the person who's misspelled that has to go back and correct it. But uh, for everybody, I've said, right, now go back and improve your answers. And then w one smart so and so said, well, if I got them wrong then, I'm not going to get them right now, am I? I said, ah, yes, but look, what you're missing is the mark scheme now. I am. If you click on the mark scheme, what you should see, if you scroll down to, to this page here, there we can see are the answers. So when I asked you earlier, 
did you think that they were true or false? You can now see that you were all correct with that one. So you should pat yourself on the back going, yes, yay, I did okay on that. Now, Anthony, you, you, you were saying this is earlier entry into GCSE, and that, that's not exactly what we're doing. So our school has the traditional um, stru structure where children follow courses in 7, 8, and 9, key stage 3 courses, and then around about the spring term of year 9, they then make those choices for the GCSEs for starting in year 10, which and they start in the September. Now, I know lots of other schools have got other models, but we haven't swapped over to any of those. But what, what I'm now hoping, and, and this is a model that's going to take a couple of years for it to be embedded, but that this key stage 3 model will will result in children who are much better informed about whether GCSE computing is the kind of thing that's for them. Now, when I, when I mentioned earlier that there are some year 10s, and, and I've had even a couple of my year 11s say to me, I really wish I hadn't chosen this subject. It's not at all what I thought it was. And some of them blame me, and, and, and some of them blame themselves. I've also met children in year 10 and year 11 who, when I've seen them like uh, on the corridor or, or on break duty, and they're because they're not in my classroom anymore, they'll say, sir, oh, I, I, I've been talking to Anthony Meller and he was telling me what they did. I really wish I'd chosen it. I thought it was this or that. And, um, and I've met some children. I've had, uh, like, for example, I've had an email from a child who's now at our partner sixth form college. So he's in year 12. He's doing A-level computing. And she says he's really regretting not doing the GCSE computing because he's decided he wants to go into software development. And, you know, he, he wished he'd been better informed in year nine, but he went, he chose Spanish instead, you, you, you know, this kind of thing. So I'm really hoping that this will be like a three year long options program to enlighten children as to what would be the best thing for them to follow. Now, I'm going to move into the, the, the next segment or section. It would be quite helpful if you can just give me some kind of little bit of feedback at the moment, and I'll try and respond to that. Like, is it, is it, should I open up the microphones and allow people to speak? Are you happy just to sit and listen? Is this working for you? You, you, you know, you're getting some value from it. And if you're not, you can always just close your browser and go back and uh, spend some time with your family. And you've got the recording to come back and look at. But it, 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 little things like that, because I can't see your faces. You're not sat there right in front of me. Um, if there's anything you want me to change or adapt as we go along. And while you're thinking about that, I'm just going to mention Homework Club. So. If you were very keen-eyed before, you may have spotted all these numbers over here on the left. And in a previous webinar, um, I was discussing homework. And I have a system that I've set up for homework, which you can, you can find and you can look at. If you click on here where it says homework topics, you'll see another document will open up. And this is in relation to my year 11 GCSE computing class. Now, I didn't teach these children when they were in year 10. They were taught by a colleague of mine, for various reasons I now have this class. And each of them has a topic, or two topics every week. So they get homework tonight. So let's have a look. What, what homework should they be doing right now? So if we go to the 22nd of October, they've actually got two topics tonight for homework. Innovative computer design and input and output devices. Now, I won't see them till after the half-term holiday. But they are researching these topics as part of their homework. And they have an orange book. And if you look through my various notes and stuff, you'll see examples of what these orange books look like. I've, I've got a, a video at the very top, a little YouTube video. It might cause problems if I click on it now. But have a look at that video. Let me just see. Should I can possibly pause it. And when this video comes on, you'll see... I actually explain about these books, what the point of the books is, how it works, is a, you know, the, the mechanism, all of that kind of thing. And some of the teachers have told me that they're starting to adapt and adopt, because both those words work. Some, some of the teachers are adopting this, this, this pattern that I'm using for setting homework, and, but they're adapting it to make it fit their own um, particular circumstances. So there's a link to that video um, if you go to the year 11 GCSE computing, and you click on what says homework topics. Now, why did I mention the video? Because, trace back, I've got here a great book for those children. And 
you can tell by looking that Lucas is the kind of child who never ever does homework. So week after week after week, Lucas doesn't do his homework. Let's find the opposite end of the spectrum. We've got Emily. Emily always does homework and she pretty much always gets five out of five. Now those points, they, they're not awarded for, um, oh gosh, Emily, you're so clever. You're getting all of these answers correct. No, they're actually for very mundane things like you get one point for writing the title of the homework across the top and the date and underlining it. If it's not underlined or you've not written it in full, you don't get one point for that. The second point is for um, having a minimum of writing. If you look at the resource material I've given you, just copy it all out verbatim or one paragraph, you don't get that one point. There's one point for images and diagrams and doodles. And what I want them to do is when they look at the topic that I've given them the resources for, I don't want them to copy it exactly. I want them to try and summarize. Like if I said to you now, um, tell me a few words. Where did you go in the summer? What did you do for your holidays? You might say, oh, I went to Rome. We, we, we saw some people in the basilica. There was fountains. That's exactly what I want to see. I want to see some pictures that kind of summarize what it is that you've seen for that topic. Fourth point is, um, there should be some key terms on there that I want to highlight in some way. Those, those are words that you should be using, adding to your vocabulary. And then the fifth point is, have you made a full use of the page? Now, of course, course it's fantastic when people have five out of five for every single one, or four, or fours. It's a training for a real competition. Some of them some are in the class. class. Okay, I'm okay, going to pause, pause for a moment. See, see, these are important reports. Sound, sound, no problem. I'll just pause, I'll just pause, pause carry on, carry on, talk by it. And then see, can you, can you still you hear me? Hear me? Can, can you, you hear, hear me? Ah, uh, uh, okay, so, okay, so sometimes, sometimes there are bandwidth issues. issues. And I'll just pause for a moment. I'll just keep talking. Hello, Hello. robots, robots. 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 Hello, 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 hello. Can you hear me clearly? Oh, okay. So, so I'm pausing for a moment. That's a pause to wait and see. Okay, so how about now? Can you hear me clearly now? Better. Okay. I think we we sometimes get these little glitches, and I don't know why. We have a really, really fast connection at school, and it's got lots of bandwidth. And I'm in school at the moment. You can maybe tell by the, the classroom and, and that around me. So I'll carry on. So the, what I was saying earlier, and I don't know how much you caught or not, is... It's turning into a little bit of a competition. So some children were finding that they were getting fours for their homework or threes, and they were, why, why is that a three, or was it, or, or can I improve it? So, so they were handing their books back to me and asking me to remark them. And um, wow, so the five homework points are actually in a document that I, do you know, I think I can do this now. I can share it. Um, shared it with somebody earlier today. What, what I'll do is. I'll, I'll put a link to it in the document. There's, there's a piece of paper that they stick into their books. And if I go back to the year 11 class, at the very top it says homework topics. And when you click on that, that takes you to another document that looks like too many tabs open. Looks like this. So there's all their homework topics. You can see you won't be able to download a copy of the textbook. It's 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 a uh, it's behind our Moodle because it's it's a document I can't share it online. But there is a document I need to share that just explains the guidelines. Next time, if the sound drops, I'll go and do that while we wait for the bandwidth to pick up. Or of course, if you email me, I definitely won't forget. So I was just just discussing the results that the children have had for their homeworks, which are here. So for some, it's become a real competition. Now, what is homework club? So 
I then started suggesting to some of the year 11s it would be a really good idea for them to come after school and I will work with them to ensure that their homeworks, like Ryan for example, Ryan who never does homework, Ryan I really need you to come after school. Of course Ryan is the kind that when he is in school, um, he's a little bit of a super character, um, it's hard to find out where he is and I would have to go out of my way to, to find him in school, go to his lesson period five to get him to come down. So I'm I'm, I'm really struggling to get hold of Ryan and make him come to these lessons after school. And that applies to some of the other characters that are in there. Where there's a, some, some of the other characters did have a pattern of zeros. A couple of, oh, I, I haven't mentioned, I've been sending this document home, a, an email to parents with a link to this document and saying, have a look here and see how your child is doing in terms of their homework. And I've had lots of uh, interesting emails from parents, interesting in as much as the parents are saying, thank you for sharing this. Um, my son now informs me he's up to date with all the homeworks. Or I had one parent said they found the homework book under the bed with blank pages. He won't be going on his Xbox until the homeworks are up to date. You know, So it's, it's great to see that parents are being supportive Unfortunately, the, the ones who've got Amber next to their name at the moment, I'm getting very little contact from parents and very little commitment from children um, as well. But I suppose, I mean, this, this class does represent the full a, uh, ability range within the school. And I, I don't know if you're spotting this as well. There's a pretty much a trend for people that if they complete all of their homeworks, like Casper, for example, if I highlight his line, people who in the main, complete their homeworks, also get positive test scores. You'll see lots of examples of this. You'll also see one or two that where, where they're doing their homeworks, but they're, but but this particular child here, Roman, his homeworks, when I look at him, they look like it's a last minute rush attempt, so he's clearly perhaps not reading the source material. And then we had the other one, Lucas, who I think had found a way of cheating the tests. Um, that we were doing the electronic ones. I think I know how we cheated them, and I've tried to circumvent that now, but um, oh, he was absent when we, <laughs> when we did that one in class. Now, the homework club. Why do I teach? So we had the homework club, which takes place after school, which is fairly not, not very well attended. So I then had in class a, a homework club. So we have four rows in my classroom, and on the day that we had the homework club, but we started, they came into the classroom, and okay, um, Hamid, I need you to swap places with Emily. Look, so I, I, I changed the seating plan, so we had one row of people who were the people who I put in the homework club on that day. So it would be the likes of Sebastian, Ryan, Declan, and Lucas, and, and a couple of others, like maybe Lewis on that day was in the homework club because Lewis had three zeros for his homework. So people in the homework club, you don't speak to anybody, you work in silence. You do your homework and you catch up on your homework. You do your homework, you can join the rest of the class. The rest of the class, they're working quietly on their coursework assignment. They're allowed to discuss issues if they need to. Um, they're allowed to have their MP3 players in with music on, that kind of thing. So a lot more kind of freedom for them while the others are basically in solitary while they get on with their homework. Now, some people worked really hard to get out of the homework club and then I found there's one or two of the characters who are in Amber who, um, well, they've got an awful lot of catching up to do. So that's, that's the homework club. Now, um, slightly behind some of the things I'm going to discuss uh, tonight, I'm going to try a little exercise with you. Now, some of you may have seen me do this thing before, so I'm expecting you're going to get all of these answers perfectly correct. It's, something, it's like an exercise of something I do with my classes, and we're focused on assignment, operators, and data types. Now, I'm going to fire up idle on my computer, and if you, some of you told me before you've had some experience of text-based programming, and some of you hadn't, have had none. And I'm going to ask you some questions, and I'm going to ask you to type in the answer. As soon as it comes into your head, you're going to type it into the chat, even if you think the answer is wrong. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to assign the value of 1 to a variable, which I'm calling A, and I press Enter. And now I'm going to create another variable called B, and I'm going to assign the value of 2 to that, and I press Enter. Now, I'm just going to wait for a moment for that to appear on your screen, because there seems to be a little bit of a lag. 
And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask it to add A plus B together. And I'm going to press Enter. Now something will appear on the next line. And what I'd like you to do is could you type into the chat what do you think is going to appear on the next line? So I'll pause for a moment while you think about that. So I'm expecting to see lots of you now at your keyboards typing in what's going to happen when I press Enter. Okay, so great. We've got two answers already, and I love the fact that they're different from each other. So only four people have replied so far, and I can see we've we've got quite a few participants. How many have we how, how many have we got in tonight? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So we've got fourteen people. Okay, great. So we've got a, a, a whole variety of answers. So we've got 3, 12, it will crash, and then nothing. Now, what I would do with my classes, um, this this is some, a practice that I use, I'm about to talk about now, and I was at a school yesterday, I was at Altrincham Girls Grammar School yesterday, and they said they call it pose, um, pause, pounce, and bounce. Now, I, I, I use some of those, and I have some, I, I have them um, as well. Um, a probe, okay, so I'm going to do some probing in a moment. So, so Clara, you said three. Now, you told me that earlier that you've got a, a background, a, 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 you know, in computer science. So, um, I'm just going to leave you for a moment because I think we're going to prove you wrong in a moment, Clara, and, and, and you'll see why. But I'm going to go to Paul. Now, Paul, you said 12, and I in class I'd say, why, why did you say 12? Because, Paul, you see, you're often very, very right with, with these kind of things. You said 12, well, um, and Paul would say, um, well, because well, A is 1 and B is 2. And if you put a 1 there and a 2 there next to each other, it looks like 12. And I'd say, do you know, Paul, I can actually see an awful lot of logic in what you're saying. Let's try, so, let's try the other answer. So, so Dan, you said it's going to crash. Why? Well, well because, sir, um, you've only said add A plus B, but you haven't really like told it what to do. So, it, it, in fact, I don't want to say it's going to crash. I think we're going to get a syntax error. Okay, so we've got three different answers there. Now, um, let's go back to Clara's answer. So, sorry, Clara, you said three. Who agrees with Clara in the classroom? Okay, three people. So, um, so Michael, wh why are you saying you agree with Clara? Um, I, I don't know, sir. I, ju I just thought I'd go for that one. But come on, don't tell me you don't know. Well, why did you not go for the other two? Well, well, sir, it seems like the one that's the most logical. Okay, right. So, um, and I would do this kind of process where I would go around and ask others in the class and say, right, well, now what we're going to do is we're actually going to find out what the answer. Let's just do a quick vote again. Let's see. Oh, so some of you changed. Oh, Michael, you've swung over now. You've decided to say what uh, what 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 Paul said before. Okay, so here we go. So I press enter. And, and sometimes I'm a bit of a <laughs> one thing is I'll just pause before I press enter and I'll watch and you can see they're almost sat on the edge of their seats. That's that's a real good dramatic effect to use. If if a colleague of yours has popped in to observe you, like a formal observation just drop in just to demonstrate engagement. So I press enter. And if the answer has appeared on your screen, you'll see it returns the value of three. So Clara is now punching the air going, yes, 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 I got it right. <laughs> Whereas Paul, Paul's going, oh, oh, right, oh, I, oh, right. But I'm really glad that Paul said it was 12 because, and Michael as well, because if they hadn't said that, we'd have all just gone, oh, okay, so it's 12. So um, I could also do something like this. I could say A plus B minus B times A divided by b and then i could say so what do you think the answer might be this time now it would be nice if you try and type in what you think the answer might be but what i'm really trying to demonstrate is this this is some of the some of the strategies i try and use so when we said before pose pause bounce uh, pounce bounce <laughs> one of the ones i like to do is to predict you know if because actually Clara did come up with the right answer. But I didn't just want to go on that straight away because there were some learning opportunities we, we would have lost. So that's where the probing came in. And one of the things I try and do, if Clara was sat here in front of me, I might have tried to unnerve her a little bit and unsettle her just to see how secure she was. And, and she may have said, there's no way you're going to fool me on this one because I just know A is an integer, B is an integer, you've assigned the values. And 
And I'll, okay, Clara, Clara, I give up. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right. Okay. Now, um, we've not had any answers typed in. So that means some of you playing chicken. So like Sajid and Naomi and Les. Oh, okay, Les. Okay, so we've got an answer. Let's find it. We'll press enter. Oh, so Anthony, you put two with a question mark, which suggests you weren't that sure. Or maybe Anthony had Python running in a in a in idle and a, or an interpreter, and he was able to test it out then. And and one of the things I might have done with the class was say, oh, now this is interesting. Now there's a rule which we know of, which which we might call bid mass or bod mass, and that means we go brackets indices divide. Oh, look, there's a division there. So whatever it's, we're going to divide this thing by what this is and then multiply, add, and subtract. So we could also do exactly the same thing. We'll put brackets in different places. Let's just see. Put brackets here. Is this likely to change? So this is just like a true or false thing. Yes, if you think it's likely to change the answer this time. So just type in yes or no if you think it's not. Now, if this was um, one of the days I do, like where you, you, you sign up for a course to come into my school and you're all sat there in front of me, we could have a totally different experience from what we're having now because we can dialogue, we can pass the answers backwards and forwards. So it seems like most people think we are going to get a different answer this time. So here's the moment of the reveal. And a little secret is here, I could say to you, because I'm so bothered about the agenda and what we're going to do and watching all technology, I don't actually know myself what's going to happen next. And this is one of the beautiful things. And you can even say to class, you know, being honest, I don't actually know. So when I'm playing such a poker with you, like, show me your hand, is this, that, it was exactly the same answer. Whereas, oh, what was my question? I think my question was, will we get a different answer? So maybe there, what I should have done was I should have written that down. But there we go. So what you've seen me do here, and I know some of you said you have very little experience in text-based programming. You've seen me use things like variables. So a variable is a value that can change. It's got a label attached to that. So I could have said my age is 43. And now when I type in age, that should represent a value which is 43. So when I press enter, it will now return the value of 43 because because that what age is. And I could say, what's my age in 10 years' time? So I could add 10. Notice, um, some of you very keen eye might have noticed I put a space either side of the operator. That's that's good practice. Didn't make it work or not work. It's just good practice. So, gosh, 10 years' time, I'm going to be 53. Um, and you can do another thing as well. Say, so we had A and B. We didn't have a variable called C yet. So C plus A. So I'm going to ask you to add those together. You're going to tell me what you predict will happen when I press enter. So A is 1, B is 2, C plus A. I'm typing your answers. So you're thinking what it's going to be. So Shirley says it's going to be an error. Now, Shirley's probably finding it difficult to type it on the keyboard, but she might have said, it's going to be a syntax error. Or she could have said it's going to be like a logical error. But lots of you are in agreement. You think it's going to be some kind of error. And as Janet, who's just come out of the dark, has said, C has not been defined. So C is an object, but it's an object that only exists in my head because Python doesn't recognize it. So what I'm going to do now to correct that, I'm now going to assign a value to C. So I've now made C equal to 3. So now what I can say is I'm going to say C, add C. And in the moment, I'm going to press enter. And you're going to tell me 3 plus 3 equals. Come on, this is so easy. You should all be able to tell me now straight away. Of course, 3 plus 3 equals 6. So Janet, you think you've got the right answer? Oh, hang on. I think I've just planted a seed of doubt in Janet's mind. Because even though she's saying yes, when Janet said yes to me, she went, yeah, which suggests like maybe she's not so convinced. So why would some people be typing in 33, Janet, if the answer is actually 6? And Janet might go, sugar shoulders, I don't know. And now Janet, oh, Janet's starting to change her mind, and I haven't actually pressed enter yet. 
Janice is starting to think, perhaps it might be 33. And Anthony thinks it's an error. Anthony probably would say, uh, oh, sir, um, didn't you tell us that a, a character in between speech marks is a string, um, therefore you can't add strings together? And I say, did I say that, Anthony? Did I really say that? Let's press enter and see what happens. And I'm doing that thing again. I'm doing that deliberate pause to wait and see. Have I? Who's paying attention? So here we go. So I could be really mean and say that actually nobody got it right because, oh, Anthony said, ah, three in inverted. So Anthony was probably the closest. It's returned a string, three, three. Because what it's actually done, you can concatenate strings. That means you can take one and join it to the other. And this highlights an issue that I find with my year 10s. When I go to tackle the coursework assignments, the controlled assessments that have been set by the exam board, it sometimes causes them problems because they might say um, a question like age equals input. Question, how old are you? Question mark, close brackets. So it's going to ask me now how old I am. So I type in 43. And now if I type in age, it's going to return the value of 43. So I haven't highlighted what the problem is yet. And then the problem might say, now, how old would this person be in 10 years' time? Well, surely that would be age plus 10. But that's going to cause a problem, a problem that uh, probably, for some people, this may be too high level at the moment if you've got very limited experience in text-based programming. But the problem may be is to do with data types. So I mentioned string before and integer. Now, these are words that we use to describe different types of data. Now, computers need to know. And you, can, I mean, you might listen to me and think, oh, Alan really knows his stuff. But I have no background in computer science. I didn't do a degree in it. It was just four years ago. I thought, I'm going to have to start teaching this GCSE. So I've had to learn. I've had to swat up in all of these things. And I, and I might accept sometimes I don't think, get things exactly right. And then people correct me. And then I correct my own understanding. But an integer is a whole number which can't be expressed with any fractional elements. So like 2.0 before up here, 2.0 is not an integer. It's a float which is short for floating point number. Um, Python highlights strings in green. Strings are a character or a sequence of characters that are normally marked out by speech marks or apostrophes. So age, here's the problem. Age, we, we, we're not, we might not be exactly sure what data type it is. Now we know that we can add strings together, it concatenates. We know that we can add integers together. It, 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 there's the sum of a plus b. What happens when we try to add 43? Notice what I'm doing, 43. What happens when we try and add that to 10? So some of you are going to tell me what they think might happen next. But maybe the advanced learners are going to say, they're going to tell me what I need to do to correct it. I want it to return 53, which is, so I could say something like So while you're doing that, I'm going to add a little bit more um, garnish or jewelry into what I'm doing. So your age in 10 years will be. So, hmm. Okay, so, so some of you have picked up on what that is, and I wouldn't expect that everybody would be. But what I can actually do is I can do what's called casting. I can actually cast age, which is currently a string. I can now cast it as an integer, which say take this string, which is a number in speech marks, but just turn it into a number, a whole number, just for a few moments for the purposes of what we're doing. And let me see if this works. I just click on the end of the line, press enter, and there we have it. If I go back and show you what happens without that casting, this is going to cause a problem. Press enter, and the error that it throws back, it says you can't convert it to an integer implicitly. You would have had to be explicit 
to do so. Now, um, Janet, you said I need to delete some commas. Now, um, in in that in this line here, you know, just so this is something that people don't often understand. Actually, um, et, what's the word? Eti in terms of etiquette, there should have been a space after that comma there. I should have put that in, but you can use a comma as a separator when you're using uh, the print function. So in Python, the print function can take more than one argument. So if we've got one argument there, and we've got another argument here. Now, you actually, you could say that there's a third argument. But when it saw age plus 10, it cannot output mixed data types together like in, in the way that we said. So, um, so the line earlier, age equals 43. Ah! So that, that was a really good question. So this is going to turn it. So that was Shirley. So Shirley, watch. Age equals 42. Because last year I was 42. This time when I press enter, what I've actually done by now reassigning 42 to the variable age, I've actually physically changed the whole value of that. So when I press enter this time, it should tell me that my age in 10 years time will be 52. And if I'd said... If I go back now and say to you, um, A equals, this is a memory test now, or oh, when we're just slightly over time, so A equals 2, and now I ask you to tell me what is A plus C, could you please return, you, uh, tell me what do you think A plus C is going to be this time, so it's a bit of a memory test, just waiting for the first one or two persons to type it in, yep, James, that's, I, I should have mentioned that, I'll do that in just a moment, so Clara, oh dear, Clara's got an answer wrong. And so has Anthony. And really, Anthony, I thought you were going to be one of my star pupils. So those people who've got sharp memory or just look up the screen might remember that C was a string with a value of 3. An A earlier was 1, but I've just assigned 2, a string, to A. So I would really expect 2, 3. In speech marks because it's a string but look what I could do now is I could go int a plus c what will happen this time it returns it as 23 okay now I'm slightly over time some of you who've told your families that you'd be finished by seven may just need to go I'll tell you what will happen next I'm going to stop this recording in a few moments and in a day or two, that will all be ready and available for you to go and have a look at. I will also, tomorrow, I'll come back to this document. I'll tidy it up and put some of the links to the things. I will put in a transcript to the, 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 the sort of stuff you saw me use before in the shell. So I will copy that and I will put that in just so you can go back and have a look at that. And um, you can refer to that. And then the other thing is, before you go... I just want to mention a little bit again, which is that tonight's webinar has been brought to you for free <laughs> by the DFE, the Raspberry Pi Foundation, and RM Education. And I, I campaigned for this. I wanted to, really, if I could, I'd do as much as I can to help teachers all over the country. But clearly, there's a lot of teachers, a lot of demand, and, and, and there's lots of other people doing the same thing. So I wanted to host a number of free online webinars to help people every week. Um, and you help shape these. You can send me questions and say, look, um, so Anthony sent me a question earlier. And really, to be polite, I should an actually answer that question before we, we, we go. It's about 8453. So, I'll, I'll, so I will answer that question tonight, Anthony, before I go. And um, <clears throat> I'll answer that in just a moment. So I'm now going to stop the recording because I think I'm going to run out of capacity.